We're very pleased today to have a guest who is extremely well qualified to talk about the nuclear weapons program. He's been in it over four decades, starting with the, the old Manhattan Project. Uh, he ended his career in a direct way in the weapons program as director of Los Alamos. I'm hesitant to say much about Harold because everybody knows all about Harold, but I'll say a few more things. He threatened me that I shouldn't read all this list of things, and I won't, because if I did, it would, it would uh, cut seriously into his time, and he said, don't do that. And I said, I wouldn't do that, didn't I, Harold? Harold uh, uh, left Los Alamos in 1979, went to become a president of General Atomics on California, and has been there until recently when he retired. Uh, having talked with him a little before this, I find he's at least ever bit as busy uh, in retirement as he ever was. And he's always been very busy. He worked till past midnight last night for a, uh, an article for the San Diego News, which we're getting in the mail for him today. So Harold's going pretty strong. He has an impressive list of, uh, of uh, uh, positions as counselor to the government, the Department of Defense, the NASA, Arms Control, uh, Air Force, Army Science Board, all of those things. I could read those off, very impressive. In addition to all those things, and he's still active in a consulting role to the government in very important uh, places, matter of fact, uh, uh, a number. Uh, he also has been awarded the E.O. Lawrence Award by the Department of Energy, I should say AEC, uh, and also the Fermi Award. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences. Of Science. I could go on and on without any further uh, words. I just want to introduce Harold Agner, and we're very happy to have him here. This has two weak links. You watch. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Tom. It's a pleasure to be here, see some of my old friends. And I do mean old friends. <laughs> I think what I want to talk about today, if you're really not over uh, 60 years old, uh, it'll be quite new to you. <laughs> uh, the rest of you will have the opportunity to correct my impressions. My wife says I'm in my antic dotage stage. <laughs> but I wanted to sort of go through what some of us did in the early days and what you are carrying on, which I consider to be extremely important for the future of the country. Part of the uh, reason for my wanting to give this talk stems from an experience I had, oh, it must have been eight or nine years ago in Washington when I happened to be in the Russell Senate office building in the South Rotunda. And there was a very large exhibit there, peace exhibit. Uh, and you'll find these peace exhibits now, Hiroshima and Nagasaki peace exhibits, pretty much worldwide. I was in Athens in May, and there was one there. And they're all pretty much the same, in particular one in Washington, in our state cap, in our national capital. And during the summer, visited by thousands of young school kids, if you've been there in Washington in the summertime. And it was a very large display. And the only pictures were pictures of Hiroshima, Nagasaki, which are pretty ghastly. No pictures of Pearl Harbor or Bataan, or Hong Kong, Nanking. And I felt very strongly that there should have been half the exhibit exhibiting Pearl Harbor, Bataan, the big sign saying, this is how it started and then have the Nagasaki Hiroshima picture and saying this is how it ended and then a final sign saying let's not ever let this happen again that I would consider to be a fair peace exhibit but that isn't the way they are and over the years there's been this continual there's even an annual marathon now in Hiroshima and there's this continual sort of put down of the United States and what we did during the 40s. 
And I would like to go back and sort of give you a brief history of what happened, at least as I saw it, uh, as a person, a very young, just wasn't even, I, I don't even think I was a technician when I got into this particular program. But you should remember that it was in 1932 that Chadwick discovered the neutron. And in deference to all my particle physicist friends, I would like to say, as far as I can figure out, it's been the only particle that's really been, that's done anything for anybody. <laughs> Keyworth, George Keyworth, Jay Keyworth, the science advisor, and I clash on this because they're going to build this $7 billion super collider, and I'm still convinced the neutron is the only particle that will ever do anything for us in a really positive way. Anyway, in 1932, Chadwick did discover the neutron. So in 1938, in December, in Berlin, when Hahn and Strassmann, you remember, bombarded some uranium with neutrons. They were chemists, and they were surprised to find in the debris barium. This really had them baffled as to what had happened, because fission had not been discovered. This is 1938. Now, this information went to Sweden, where Lisa Meitner and her nephew Otto Frisch uh, learned of this, and they thought about it a while. In 1939, they came up with the idea with the, the concept of fission. Now, I should say that the, the words which we use in the nuclear business today, fission, waste, all those sorts of things, really had a biological derivation. And, and, and in a way, it put an albatross around our neck because nuclear wastes aren't really wastes, they're just unexploited resources. Uh, many of the terms we use are now used, uh, we continue to use them, but people associate with them certain negative aspects of the world in which we exist, and it's, it's been unfortunate. But anyway, the concept of fission, something dividing, they use the concept of fission. Frisch uh, told Bohr, who was visiting, the, the reason they were in Sweden was because uh, they were Jewish and they were running away from Hitler. This was in 1939. Frisch told Bohr about the idea, and Bohr said, well, keep me informed if, you know, it's an interesting concept. And then uh, later on, you remember the story of Bohr being smuggled out of Denmark in the back of a, I think it was a B-25, almost suffocated because his uh, oxygen mask came off. Uh, but Meitner and Frisch did an experiment, and they confirmed, this was in January 1939, that uh, indeed fission did take place. And I remember talking with Otto Frisch and saying that at that time, Bohr was in the United States, and he thought he pr probably should send a telegram. But just to show you how the world's changed, he said, in those days, you only sent a telegram when somebody died. And he thought about it about three days, because he, he was worried about the shock on Bohr of just getting a telegram, regardless of what the uh, message was. But he finally mustered up his courage, sent a telegram across the Atlantic to Bohr, saying that, indeed, uh, fission was real. They had done an experiment to confirm it. And it was at that time that uh, Herb Anderson was at uh, Columbia. He was an electrical engineer and had some equipment. And uh, he ran into Bohr. Bohr was just walking around. And Bohr started telling this graduate student about this phenomenon. Anderson went to Fermi. He had appropriate equipment. And as his thesis, he didn't confirmed that fission did take place, and he also confirmed that more than one neutron came out in the process of fission. And once that was clearly known, this is in 1939, it became pretty clear that one could have a nuclear chain reaction. So you can sort of say that in six years, from a discovery, absolute basic scientific discovery of a concept, uh, it was in a way confirmed and the implementation was set forth. This is really from 1932, discovering a particle and having a, a practical concept of what could happen. Now, you probably heard the story of, of Zillard, who uh, wanted to get this to President Roosevelt to say what the importance was. Zillard actually patented chain reaction, bombs, the whole business. 
early on. If you read his book, Voice of the Dolphins, it's, it's very interesting. Zillardin Teller decided that the way to get to Roosevelt was to go to Einstein and have him sign the letter. And then Einstein would talk to a man named Sachs who had an entree with Roosevelt. Uh, neither Zillard nor Teller could drive a car then, so Bernie Feld, who's still a professor at MIT, had a car. He drove them up to Princeton and they delivered the letter. Subsequently, Roosevelt did approve doing research in this particular field, and they started out with a tremendous sum of $5,000, which I guess was a lot of money then. During that period, if, if you recall, 39, 40, 41, uh, the fear of, of what was happening in Europe was permeating in the United States. Uh, you should remember that during that time, Fermi had gotten a Nobel Award in 1938. The only way he could get out of Italy was to go get his Nobel Award. So he went to Sweden and then kept coming. That's how he came to the United States. He was not Jewish, but his wife was, Laura. Interesting, Laura's father was the most decorated and most famous Italian admiral of that period. He had been awarded our equivalent of the Medal of Honor. He ended up in Auschwitz, in the gas chamber. So it was a real uh, fear, a real situation that caused those people to leave. Among them, of course, were Teller, Zillard, Wigner, von Neumann, Beta, Segre. A whole gang of them had come over, and all in the back of their minds, they did know, and at that time it was true, the Center for Nuclear Research was in Germany. And they knew the people who had remained, and they knew what their potential was. So there was this gnawing fear that the Germans would achieve success in the nuclear field before we did. The project really started in July in 1941 at Columbia, where Fermi uh, had put together a what was called an exponential pile. You remember it was on uh, 7th of December when Pearl Harbor took place. Before that time, many of uh, my classmates had run off to Canada, not to get out of the war, but to get into the war. It was, it was different than in the 60s. <laughs> See, we were not at war, and it was against, it's against the law for us to do that, but these people had gone into Canada, joined the RCAF, and many of them were shot down in the Battle of Britain. In fact, the president of my freshman class at the University of Denver lost his life there. Uh, of course, Hong Kong fell on Christmas Day in 1941. If you ever go to Hong Kong on Christmas, you should go to the Peninsula Hotel and, uh, and see the ceremonies that they conduct. Uh, they have not forgotten a particular massacre that took place in the hospital there where the Japanese came and literally hacked up all the doctors, all the nurses, and all the patients. It was a curse. In 1937, when they invaded China, in Nanking Long alone, they had murdered 200,000 civilians. They, they were... If you look back in Time and Life articles in that period, uh, not only were we frightened, we were very angry with uh, the people in the Pacific. I think we were much more angry with them than we were with the Germans. Uh, in point of fact, if you were a prisoner of war of Germany, your survival probability was better than 95%. If you're a prisoner of war in Japan, it was less than 25%. One of your former colleagues, Jack Howard, I don't know, you may think he has a funny little hitch in his get-along. He spent over a week dragging uh, a shot-up leg along with him in the jungles of the Philippines, uh, just living on roots and snails and fish. and. Uh, he had quite a time. He doesn't talk about it, but there are a lot of heroes in that period. Now, the project gets started in a very interesting way. Here was something that very few people had known about, knew about. It was a completely new scientific field. There were three centers in the United States in academe that were somewhat related to the field. At Berkeley, you had Lawrence, who was working on accelerators. At Chicago, you had Compton, who was, which was the center, University of Chicago, for cosmic rays. 
and they happen to have a high altitude observatory in Mount Evans in Colorado, and that's sort of the way I got involved. And then at Columbia, you had Fermi and Dunning, people like that. So there were three centers that at least knew what a Geiger counter was, which is about the stage that we were at in those days. So how do you put a project together? Well, these three individuals put out the word to their previous graduate students, who are now professors throughout the country. And they, in turn, picked up their graduate students and whatever undergraduate students they thought would be appropriate, and they all went back. It was sort of like a chain letter, but done by a telephone. And they all went back to their original institutions and built up what would, one might call the engineering scientific nuclei that put this particular project together. Now, it was just a year later, on December 2nd, 42, when the first chain reaction came into being at Chicago, Stag Field. I was fortunate and happened to be there at the time. And as I mentioned, the only reason I got involved, I was just about to join the Army Air Corps. Maybe I could have been famous like Sam Donnelly down here, but my physics professor said, no, don't do that. He says, there's something that's going to happen and you're going to go to Chicago and don't sign up. Just wait a couple of weeks. So I waited a couple of weeks, and the next thing I knew, I was in Chicago. And that was because he had been a student at Compton's, and he had been called back. He was running the High Altitude Observatory on Mount Evans, and he was called back to Chicago when the project started. Now, an interesting point, I wanna, I'm gonna, this is going to be a sort of a weird presentation, because I'm going to show you some slides. I'm going to show you a movie. I'm going to give you a little song in Lumiere. I think what I want to do first is show you a couple of slides having to do with secrecy. Edward Teller has been running around talking about how terrible secrecy is. One has the impression that the military put secrecy on our backs. It's not so at all. I'm going to show you a couple of slides, uh, which were, to my knowledge, the first notices that things were going to be classified. Can I have the first? I think there's three slides. And there's a button here. And let me, if it's turned on, Okay, now there's the first one, which was dated February 11th, 1942. And you see, it's from Compton. I think you can read it. Now, the interesting part is he chose a particular individual to uh, write up the rules. Now, most of you aren't Yale graduates in theoretical physicists, but the man that he chose was a man named Gregory Bright, who, in my opinion, had to be the, the most paranoid individual <laughs> theoretical physics has ever had. Most of them are slightly along that line, but this guy... <laughs> was convinced that everyone was stealing his work. Second, he never got the credit he deserved. And third, if you ever talk to any of his graduate students, uh, they really were in bondage for a long time, <laughs> working for him. I, I think getting out of there must have been tougher than trying to get to a ranger school today. Now, these are the rules. And I think there's probably too much here to uh, to read, but it was from Bright, and uh, it was completely new. Well, what he's saying is, look, uh, we're going to prevent leaks to the enemy. That's the way he starts. This is interpreted by the Army and Navy as implying also the prevention of leaks to the public and to anyone who is not specifically authorized to receive information about a particular type of work. Through a long experience, the Army and Navy have found out that secrets are kept best through a system of compartmentation of the information. The fewer persons who know about a secret, the more, smaller chance of this escaping. And then, uh, let me read the last paragraph here. It says, conversations regarding the work in public places, public places such as trains, restaurants, and so forth. This rule has been followed religiously by the group which I was associated at the Washington Navy Yard. Only the most disguised form of reference to work in a public case would be tolerated in that group. In this connection, members of the Metallurgical Project were reminded that it is quite possible that some of the waiters in restaurants and even some of the university employees may be foreign agents. 
If it becomes known through conversations at lunch that cadmium and indium are of a special interest to this group, and if this information is correlated with the personnel involved, there will be little doubt left regarding the objectives of the group. Now, quite frankly, from my standpoint at the time, I never even heard of a neutron. And what cadmium and indium had to do with anything uh, was beyond me. <laughs> now, uh, this was the, these were the documents. And now what I'd like to do is play a little tape, uh, which you're going to hear two voices. The first is Laura Fermi, and the second is Enrico Fermi. So if we could have those, and I think this slide can go off. Thank you. Mrs. Fermi remembers. They imposed secrecy on themselves, and then I didn't hear anything for years until the Smith report was ready. Then one day we were still in Los Alamos, so it must have been 1945 still. Enrico came with a mimeographed copy of the Smith report and said, maybe you are being interested in in reading this, and he didn't volunteer any help, so <laughs> it was pretty hard going, but then I understood what had gone on, why the secrecy, the pile, we didn't know anything about the pile. And Ten years after the secrecy, Enrico Fermi himself dispelled some of the misconceptions about who imposed the secrecy. Secrets in science did not exist to any appreciable extent before the war. The military importance of science appears to have brought the necessity of at least some amount of secrecy. In this respect, perhaps, many people believe that keeping uh, secret results in the field of atomic fission uh, that could lead to the development of the atomic bomb was imposed on the scientists by the military authorities. The truth is quite different, and the first agreements to keep certain results confidential were entered into freely among scientists in this country long before the government or the armed services manifested any interest in the matter. In the spring of 1942. Thank you. So, uh, when you get it from the Pope, as Fermi was known, that indeed the scientists imposed the first secrecy on their work, uh, some of the noise that's being made these days uh, aren't quite factual. I think it was important uh, to have the secrecy, and it certainly was rigorously applied. Now let's go back. It was in late 19, as soon as the pile was successful, it's interesting, the first pile, as I mentioned, was an exponential pile at Columbia. It was a cube about eight feet on a side. It wasn't working very well, and the reason was there was no quality control in the graphite or in the uranium oxide, which was used in the pile. Uh, at the time, they didn't know what many of the nuclear cross-sections were, so they thought perhaps the trouble was that nitrogen in the air was absorbing the neutrons and reducing the criticality of that particular experiment. So they encapsulated this eight-foot cube in a galvanized iron box and evacuated it. That didn't improve things. So then they decided, if you remember, Fermi was the, the godfather of using slow neutrons. They decided, well, if they would put in a better moderator, such as hydrogen, perhaps things would work better. So they were all ready to uh, fill this particular can. Since it was evacuated, it was easy to do with propane. Now, this particular pile was right in the middle of the campus in Columbia. <laughs> it's very interesting. Uh, we were about to do this. I, I was there. And Diz Graves, Elizabeth Graves, you probably remember Al Graves, his wife, they were both students at the University of Chicago who had just graduated. Diz said, well, yeah, we can get in. How are we going to get out? And there was long thought. And Fermi says, well, we better think about that. And after about a day, they decided that it was just too dangerous an experiment because of trying to get the hydrogen out. So the first worry about safety in nuclear reactors had nothing to do with the nuclear reaction, had entirely to do with the potential of a chemical explosion. And I've always been amazed that we really never knew until it happened what, how the pile was going to react because delayed fission was not known in those days. Had there only been prompt fission, of course, the stag field experiment would have been a very dicey affair. 
Uh, as a result of that, it was decided that the experiment would be moved to Chicago and there was a rapid buildup under Stagg Field. In the meantime, as soon as it, they were pretty confident, the construction at Hanford was begun. I, I still say the real hero of the whole Manhattan Project was Leslie Groves. Had he been six foot four and, and, and slim and had a proper military bearing, I think he really would have gotten the accolades he deserved. But in fact, he was sort of a roly-poly. And he wore uh, khaki uniforms and wore an overseas hat. And, the, and he traveled all the time. And I don't think he ever changed his shirt or his trousers or anything. So he, he just looked messy. He didn't look, he didn't look the way a proper military officer should look. But he absolutely had to be a genius to get all the projects together, get all these prima donnas working together. And he certainly had his neck out on the line by expending the funds he did. But he did it. He got it all done. There was a sign uh, outside of Caltech in the early 30s. You know how they used to write on big rocks, Jesus saves? Well, one day at Caltech, some graduate student got up there at night and wrote underneath it, yes, but Milliken gets the credit. <laughs> you remember Milliken got a Nobel Prize for discovering the positive electron. Well, in a way, I have the feeling that many people associated with the Manhattan Project uh, got the credit, but uh, it was really Groves that put it all together. And it was really a remarkable endeavor. If you realize, as I mentioned, 1932, a particle was discovered. 1938, 39, fission was discovered. And between 42 and 45, reactors were built, first time in the world. Metallurgy of, of, of an entirely new element was produced in kilogram quantities, plutonium. Isotope of uranium-235 was separated in quantity, never before done. Whole damn thing done in three years. And then taking those materials, the technology of developing a bomb was, was implemented. It was really a tremendous effort on the part of, of your uncles and fathers during that particular period. Most, most of you uncles and fathers, some of you were actually involved. Now, all the time we were at Chicago, when I was at Chicago, our, our fear was that the Germans would achieve success before we did. Uh, out of this fear came the suggestion that the heavy water plants in Norway should be destroyed, and the British commandos, you remember, did affect that raid. We had no idea what was going on in, in the world then. If you remember during the early 40s, things were going very poorly for us worldwide. Uh, tremendous loss in shipping in the Atlantic, trying to get ready to stage for the recovery of Europe. It was a mess in the Pacific uh, after the Pearl Harbor attack and the fall of Bataan, Bataan Death March. Uh, many of you may not know that it, it was very unlucky for New, New Mexicans during that period. They had an AA group that was on maneuvers in the Philippines when all this started. So that's why a large number of New Mexicans lost their lives during this particular period. They just happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. Now, in the meantime, some interesting things were happening. In 1943 in Hamburg, in just conventional air raids, 50,000 people were killed one day. In Dresden, on February 13th and 14th, in conventional air raids, 135,000 people were killed. You don't hear anything about that today. There's no, nobody making little paper cranes and putting them on Dresden. Tokyo, uh, on the 9th of March, there was a raid. 84,000 people killed. Subsequently, over 150,000 were killed in another fire, so-called firestorm raid. Essen, Berlin. Berlin had extensive shelters. In one raid there in March, 25,000 people were killed, even though they had shelters. So there were a tremendous number of people being killed. And of course, a large number of our forces were suffering casualties. Now, you remember on July 16th in Alamogordo, we actually tested in New Mexico the first plutonium device. But on that day, the heavy cruiser Indianapolis left San Francisco 
did a mad dash to Tinian, 10 days, 5,000 miles. And what it was carrying was the uranium for the little boy, the first weapon to be used at Hiroshima. It arrived on 726, went to Guam. I should mention that all of this activity was under absolute secrecy. No one in the Navy except a few people knew where the Indianapolis was going and what its itinerary was to be. It left Guam on the 28th of July. It was going to Leyte. It was due there on the 31st. But on July 30th, it was hit by a Japanese torpedo and sank in 12 minutes. Now, since no one knew where it was, there were, no one uh, realized it was lost. And in that particular incident, we lost, that was the second largest naval loss in our history. Out of a complement of 1,200 people on board, 900 lives were lost. Uh, it was on August 2nd that a routine just Navy patrol plane saw some debris, and that's how the remaining 300 were, were saved. So again, uh, it was a very grim business. What would have happened had that particular ship been sunk on its way over? We'll never know, but obviously uh, Tinian and all the islands were under surveillance by the Japanese. Now on August 6th, of course, is when we took off and went to Tinian, went to uh, Hiroshima, 70,000 lives were lost. And, and the press rounds it up to 100,000, and the press rounds it up to 150,000. They keep increasing the number, but keep in mind that the number killed in Germany in conventional raids or in Tokyo was much larger. No one mentions that. August 9th, of course, there were about 40,000 killed at Nagasaki. Now, I guess part of my... Uh, concern is that people seem to forget uh, what we were endeavoring to do, which was to bring the war to a close, to win it and bring it to an end. Sometimes you bring things to an end, you don't win it. But our objective was to win and bring things to an end. Now you read today, many people say we should have had a demonstration. Keep in mind that uh, on the first bomb, I only had one of those, it might not have worked. And that would not have been a very good demonstration. The senior military men of the time are now quoted as saying, we shouldn't have used the bomb. It was just a matter of time until the Japanese surrendered. Uh, but what would have happened during that time? Had we actually invaded, the thing that really depressed me when I was out there was seeing the number of hospitals that were being built. And again, if you look back in Life magazine, some of the declassified uh, issues which they put out after the war, they had government documents, it showed that we were really preparing for a thousand de million deaths of Allied troops. And presumably if the Japanese had kept on, there'd probably have been more than 10 million Japanese deaths. Now that's, that's one aspect of it. Now of course the generals, again, in that period saying, well, eventually it would have happened but a lot of people would have been killed. Not, not the generals, though. Keep that in mind. <laughs> and another point that people completely ignore is you remember that just a week before Hiroshima, the Russians got into the war. Now, while we were invading, let's say, the South Island, Honshu, they presumably would have been invading the North Island, Hokkaido, and the other islands. They did invade some of the Northern Islands, and, and today they still hold those islands. I'm convinced that had the war been prolonged for several months, they would now hold Honshu, and probably Tokyo would be very much similar to the situation we have in Berlin. This clearly would have prevented any normalization relations with China, and China would really have been boxed in by the Soviets controlling the Japanese islands. So a lot of history might have changed, and I think in a very bad way, had we not ended the war so quickly in addition to, to saving lives. Now, I'd like to relate a little story before I show you some slides, and uh, there's plenty of time for questions. When I was, I was in NATO, I happened to be there one day in what was called the Air, uh, Air Defense Deputy. The NATO command in, in Paris at that time was split up. All the various NATO nations each had a senior 
person who had a different area of responsibility. And the British happened to have the uh, responsibility for NATO air defense. And the person in charge that particular time was a man named Air Vice Marshal Dennis Spotswood. Uh, Spotswood had, of course, been in the uh, RAF all during the war as a young man and had stayed in the service and had reached the rank of Air Vice Marshal. He subsequently became Air Chief Marshal of the Royal Air Force and then he retired. But he was, on that day, receiving his deputy. He always had a deputy, and this particular deputy was to be a German brigadier, Air Force. And uh, I was talking with Spotswood about something. He says, look, my deputy's coming in. Why don't, why don't you stay here and meet the guy? He says, I have his dossier. He looks very well qualified and everything. So the fellow came in. He had a decided limp. And he sat down. They chatted for a while. And then this fellow pumped on his leg. And it was obviously wooden and hollow sound of, a, of an artificial leg. And he left to Spotswood and says, I lost it in the Battle of Britain. Spotswood sort of looked at him and sat up. He had a big bushy mustache. And he said, sir, you bloody well deserved it. <laughs> and that's the way I've felt whenever I see people going off to uh, float their little boats and their candles, uh, I just felt they bloody well deserved it. Uh, but it's all over. And I should mention that Spotswood and his deputy never spoke of the incident again. We worked together as professionals. The same way we have very good relationships with our Asian colleagues today. It's all over. But I must say that I personally resent this year after year uh, sort of con continual reminding us of what had transpired, not in the context that we shouldn't let it happen again, but at least the way I take it, that we somehow were at fault. And I don't think we were at all. We didn't start it. Those colleagues of ours who lost their lives, people that had a long chunk, those who survived had a long chunk of their life, you know, sort of just used up. Uh, we did a very good job. I think we can all be proud of it. And I think what you are all doing here today is something extremely important. There's been no major war. And part of the reason, I think, is that for the first time, these weapons of mass destruction make it such that those who wage war, not wage it, but those who say we will start a war, make the decision. The decision makers, for the first time, are at equal risk for those individuals who actually have to go out and fight the war. So now what I want to do is show you some particular slides. Think about that. And, <laughs> and when some of these young people say, you know, we've got to ban the bomb and got to get rid of it, uh, say, yeah, you know, what's going to happen is the politicians and decision makers are going to put bows and arrows and axes and good old plain bullets in your hands, and they're going to tell you to go out and fight a war. And they're going to be completely home scot-free. Okay, let's, let's look at some slides. What I'm going to do is run some, through some slides of, that I took when we were out on Tinian and then show you the, the movies which were taken of the bombing Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and then we'll have some questions. This is one of the main Japanese headquarter buildings on the island of Tinian. As you can see, a lot of people did a lot of work before the scientists and engineers showed up. Again, just fortifications completely blasted. I was, I was remembering the other night when I first landed on uh, Kwajalein, on the runways there, you could pick up bullets which were more uh, in abundance than were stones or seashells. Spent bullets, big bullets, 30 caliber, 50 caliber, you know, the lead bullets, just all over the place. And of course, wrecked airplanes, tanks, all sorts of equipment that would just get bulldozed off the runways into the, to the ocean. Tremendous. This is a cemetery on Tinian. Most of the people buried here were Seabees. Seabees build all this. It's always impressed me. Way out there in Tinian. This is the type of uh, terrain which was on Tinian. Tinian Island was very much like Manhattan Island. And it was laid out 
by the sea bees as if it were a Manhattan Island, and all the names of the streets and everything were streets as if we were on Manhattan Island. <laughs> Uh, if you remember the signs we had at Los Alamos, they said Pelegro, and they used to have a hand saying keep out, well, there's the equivalent. Uh, it's gorgeous beaches and things in the Marianas, just gorgeous beaches. This is the type of, this is where the sea bees lived, they were a little better off than we were. <laughs> chapel, and they ought to be, they, they were there first. This is the beach, didn't worry about swimming suits or anything. Uh, this is the harbor at Tinian, where the Indianapolis uh, came in. Our field, or two fields, we were in the north field. The thing that impressed me, if you ever have to go to the war, be in the Navy, on, on land. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we lived in tents, and we had metal trays that you got your food slopped on. You stood in the rain to get it, and the water would fill up in the tray. You ate outside. When you got done, you had a big 50-gallon drum that had a fire on it, and that's the way you sloshed your tray again. And this is the way all the people on the North Island existed. I mean, the generals, Admiral Parnell, who was with us, all these people, all the same way. But on the south end of the island was a Navy field. And I, I was invited. I had a uh, college classmate who I found out was Lieutenant J.G. in the Navy and he invited me down. We would get a ration of a couple of Cokes a week. He had a, he had a really like a little Quonset hut, all of his own, with a refrigerator. And stacked next to the refrigerator were cases of Coke. <laughs> and they ate indoors, had white tablecloths and napkins. <laughs> and they were served. And afterwards, they had movies inside this big Quonset hut. They didn't even have to have... When we had movies, and it rains out there all the time, you'd wear your hard hats, and you couldn't hear the sound for the rain beating on your hard hat. <laughs> so I suggest, if you ever have to go to war, be in the Navy on land. <laughs> I think being at sea is pretty scary. This is Lord Penny, hard at work. You've probably heard of Bill Penny. He was the first head of the British Atomic Energy Commission, their equivalent to RAC in the old day. He was a real super hawk, and is so today. No apologies from Bill Penny. This is Charlie Baker and Mort Kamak. Charlie Baker was the person who briefed General Spots after the raids. Spots and his whole entourage came to Tinian and to find out what this was all about. And it was very interesting. Spots came, and he, in those days, you remember, there was no Air Force. There was an Army Air Corps. And they, they had what I consider to be the best-looking uniforms in the world, the, the pinks that they wore and, and the, the boots. And, and, but they carry this, uh, what do you call it, a riding crop? Swagger. Swagger stick. All right. Anyway, he came in with a whole entourage. He was the head and then other generals and colonels. And they all came into this Quonset hut. It was extremely hot. And this is the way we dressed. It was just awful hot out there. And Charlie Baker was to describe to him what this was all about. And at the time, of course, there were no amounts of fish and oil material. We'd used up what we had. Presumably in a couple of weeks, we could have had another Nagasaki-type bomb. But we did have the carrying case in which the plutonium had been transported out there. And the plutonium, the configuration of the plutonium was about the size of a grapefruit, small grapefruit. And the carrying case was about a cubic foot and had, was made out of beryllium, actually. And it had or beryllium aluminum alloy and had funny little heat dispenser sticking out all around it, on the end of which was a rubber cork, just to cushion the thing. It was a funny little box. Tried to increase the surface area. And well, anyway, Charlie Baker opened it up and, and pointed to the cavity. What the size of my cavity in my hand here? And saying, and the material in this cavity did this 20,000 tons, which was the number given. It was about 13 or 14,000. Spot sort of looked at him, and you could see looking at this young guy that he had the feeling this young guy was pulling his leg. <laughs> and he was doing this in front of, you know, all of his peers standing behind him. And he stood there for a while and he said, young man, you may believe that, but I certainly don't. And turned around and walked out. <laughs> and the whole gang of them walked out. And it's, it's not surprising. It's, it's really hard to imagine that a something weighing around seven, 15 pounds, would they have the equivalent, 
equivalent of 15,000 tons of high explosive. It's just something you have to get conditioned for. Well, that was Charlie's. Uh, that's me and with a guard. And that thing that scratched out is this case that had the nuclear material. After the war, the FBI came to my house in Chicago, where we were living in a garage. And he says, you have something that's classified that I have to get. And I said, well, I don't have anything. He says, well, you have photos. I said, well, yes, I have photos. And he went through them. He says, I don't see anything here. And one lesson I've learned, never volunteer anything to anybody. <laughs> but I said, well, probably what you're looking for, you know, all bubbling with enthusiasm is, here, I, here I'm carrying the case that had the material for the Nagasaki bomb. He says, oh, yeah, that's it. I must have it. And I said, well, what if I just scratch it out? Isn't that all right? He agreed that that would be all right. So that's why I have that thing looks like I don't know what it is down there, but you can see the size of the container, and that was a container that Charlie Baker <laughs> We all took turns. This is Bob Serber. I don't know if some of you may have heard Bob Serber, who was a professor at Columbia, a very outstanding theoretical physicist. Theorists worked hard. Uh, this is a view uh, of the North Island. You can see Quonset huts. We lived in tents, actually. Now, this is the north field. And there were four runways. You'll see this in the movie. And you notice most of the tails have circles with letters in them, depending on the various squadrons of the 509th composite group. The 509th was a completely self-contained unit. We had our own transport, everything. And as you, if you saw that thing on CBS the other night, Tibbetts made it very clear. His original orders were to be prepared to do a strike on Germany or Japan, or both simultaneously. So he had to have his own complete outfit. Uh, the thing that impressed me on this was, you see these four runways, there were about 450 uh, airplanes there. That island in the back is Saipan. About 450 B-29s, that's a lot of airplanes. And when they would take off, there'd be about 400 in a strike. Now that's 100 airplanes per runway, and they're propeller airplanes. They would start about 2 o'clock, 2.30 in the morning to get over Japan early the next morning. It was about a 13, 14 hour round trip. So once they started, all night long, seemed like all night long, take a couple of hours just to do the, the takeoff. And the next afternoon, they'd come back. Now, if you think you've seen traffic at National Airport, where you see the little lights, you know, the airplanes, these propeller, they go about 150, 160 knots. These things would be stacked up as far as you could see. Four rows of them. Some engines would be smoking. You could see propellers that were feathered. And some of them, of course, never came back. And I'm quite sure that those particular individuals that had to do, I don't know, 30 or 50 missions before they could come home, or go for R&R, &R, they certainly were delighted when the war ended. And I didn't care to, they certainly didn't care how it ended. It was, a, to me, a very sobering sight to see these poor guys come limping in about every third day. We get another view of Saipan in the background. You see the, the extent of the installation and the amount of uh, effort, people, and resources which were out there. Now there, you notice that's one of our airplanes. And it has that circle in a diamond, an arrow, black arrow squadron. Uh, the night before we took off for Hiroshima, Tokyo Rose came on and said, oh, black arrow squadron, we know all about you and we are ready for you. And what impressed me was the next morning when we went out to get in our, it was at night, went out, our airplanes didn't have the black arrow anymore. We had letters just like all the other boys. I thought it was sort of chicken, but it was, it was prudent. <laughs> I used to think those were big airplanes. They're really, if you go to Smithsonian, uh, they have the Enola Gay there, it's all in pieces. And you ask why they didn't put it in the museum, they were afraid that people would, uh, you know, throw red paint on it or tear it apart. The world does change. But I think there is going to be a new aeronautical museum and it is going to be put back together again. You notice how the other airplanes had the circles with the, the letters in them. 
those of you who flew and propelled airplanes, you had to push the props through because th there was always oil leakage. And if the oil got in the pistons and you tried to start the engine up, you could break the, uh, the rods. And it was quite a job. You had a, everybody, everybody in the crew, you went running and you grabbed it and you pushed it through. So one part of the job I never liked. Here's the group. This is the group from Los Alamos that went overseas. And there's some interesting people in this particular photo. I assume this is something for Star Wars. I'll hold it this way. I don't know which way it's going to work. <laughs> well, I, I, it's 50-50 chance. Now, there's Norman Ramsey, who's at Harvard today. You'll remember some of these people. There's Admiral Parsons. He was then Captain Parsons. That's a General Farrell, Admiral Parnell. This is Commander Austin Birch. Uh, this is Dick Ashworth, who lives in Santa Fe. He was the chief person. He was the equivalent of Parsons on the Nagasaki raid. There's Serber, Bernie Waldman, Louis Alvarez, uh, Larry Johnson, myself, and Alvarez. We flew on the observation plane. What we did was measure the yield using a condenser microphone and transmitting the blast wave back to us in the airplane recorded it on film. One pretty famous guy is this guy, Barney O'Keefe, who subsequently became head and re put together EG and G. He's just recently retired. And actually Don Kerr is going to replace the fellow that's replaced him as head of EG and G. So Don will be sort of an executive VP in charge of their defense work. Uh, a lot of people here, Harlow Russ, Ed Dahl, I don't remember some of the names. Quite a, I imagine there's some of the people here who subsequently came back down to Sandia when you were formed, 1946 I guess it was, split off from Los Alamos. This is Charlie Baker. It's Phil Morrison, Phil Morrison is in the news a lot today. Uh, Bill Penny. This is, to me, an interesting photo. The night before we took off, well, we didn't know when we were going to take off, but we were all called and told to come to this Quonset hut. And these are the crews of the three airplanes that went on the mission. There was one airplane that uh, carried the bomb. There's Colonel Tibbetts. Tibbetts was sort of a loner. You can, you can see that in this photo. There's nobody sitting really close to him on either side or behind him. <laughs> he was a loner. Uh, maybe he had to be that way. Admiral Parnell, there's Charles Sweeney, who was sort of the second in command. Sweeney was a pilot on the Nagasaki mission, Captain Parsons, Louis Alvarez, myself. And there's Norm Ramsey, who was the head of the Los Alamos group. And what we were told, what we were being told there was where we were going to go and what time to you know, go to church, what time to eat breakfast and all that sort of thing. And I'll show you some the strike orders in a moment here. The thing that sort of worried me was they showed us big maps of where the submarines were to pick us up in case we had a ditch. <laughs> <laughs> I had never gone on a mission before. Some of you who were actively involved in the war probably remember what your first mission was like. These are the strike orders. This is August 5th, 1945. Uh, data mission, August 6th. Briefing, see below, tells you when to have mess 23.15 to 0.0115. Lunches for these particular aircraft, trucks when they were supposed to be weathering them. Tells you the weather mission. These people flew out to look at the targets to see what the weather conditions were. Tibbets, Sweeney, that was our airplane number 89, and the other guys gasoline, ammunition. We had no guns, except in the tail. All the guns had been removed from these aircraft uh, because of the load we were carrying, 10,000 pounds. And there were no turrets. They were all luminized over, sheet metal over, a little hole about six inches in diameter. That's all you had to look out. So we did have guns in our tail gun. And the bomb, special. And this is a similar document from the uh, August 8th to the August 9th mission. And you see the combat stripe, Sweeney, 
our airplane again, 89, those driven by a name named Bach. And again, bomb special. You notice the cameras were K-20s, those are just single frame cameras. There were movies taken, and through hook and crook I got them back here over Grove's dead body. <laughs> Not literally, but it was quite a cat and mouse game, and then I finally got caught in uh, Albuquerque here, and we cut a deal that we'd take him up to Oppie, and he would decide what would happen to them. The reason for my trying to do this was everything that we sent back to the lab, we found that Groves took. So no, all the technical information data and everything we were sending back to the lab, he would first take. And many times Oppenheimer and the rest of people just didn't receive any of this. So I, my fear was if he got these particular films, we'd never see them either. Of course, I didn't know whether we had anything on the film because they were in cassettes, which was good. They couldn't process them out there or that would have happened. They were also in color, which they couldn't process. Uh, we brought them into Oppie and I had called him from Albuquerque told him what was happening and these military, I don't know whether G2 or G3 guys that were on my tail, came up with me and Oppie took the film and had arranged for a man named Julian Mack, who was head of photography at the lab then. And Julian took these particular sly, undeveloped films out to California and the next day had them back. We gave copies to the general and everybody was happy. The originals of all these things are now at the Hoover Institute at Stanford. Uh, now, I think, what, I think that's the end of these. And what we're going to do, I'm going to show you a movie of the strike and of the just general area out there. And that'll conclude the presentation. OK. Now, what you're going to see is I always start with cemeteries, or somebody does. Uh, you'll see Hiroshima first. And then you'll see a very, the, the classic picture, which is always shown as Hiroshima because it's much more photogenic in a certain sense, but it is Nagasaki. Now here's the field, water hosing. Uh, there's a tremendous installation. And you realize these existed on Guam, yes, it existed on the south end of uh, the island in which we were on. A lot of people, a lot of logistics. And when they'd have a single crash, that would close the runway. And sometimes if they had two runways closed on the beginning of a strike, the whole thing would be canceled. And you knew when that happened because the noise would stop in the middle of the early morning, night. I think coming up, yeah. Now this is all that exists of Hiroshima from a historical standpoint. We couldn't, we saw the city coming in, but then we had to get back to our instruments and it was only after the uh, detonation were we able to look out. The ground was completely obscured. This was taken through one of those little five inch portholes on the side. Our objective was to get out of there. Uh, this is when we landed. We were told to wait, that's me I guess. We were told to wait uh, while the other plane landed, and they got all the military honors. We were just met by the Los Alamos people, uh, Charlie Baker. You notice the circle in the R, no black arrow. We were not experienced photographers. <laughs> <laughs> but this is all there is. This has been cut and patched from the original. Louis Alvarez congratulating Sweeney. Louis was the boss, and he was the guy that dreamed up the idea of measuring the yield. An extremely innovative guy. That's Sweeney. Very dark. Now, this is the Nagasaki raid. That's the bomb plane. This always worried me when you looked out the, the little window. These oil, these airplanes always leak. Now you see the bomb plane. Again, no black arrow. It had a diamond this time. And now you're going to see something we never knew. You can see, you're going to see a shock wave going out. Just very quickly, you'll see a white ring go out. 
One thing we didn't know about was EMP. If we'd known EMP, we really could have determined the yield quite precisely. We didn't know where, our, there's, there it goes, see it? Very fleeting, and back in here, now you'll see the fireball beginning. Second mission, people were much better prepared. These films have been very useful uh, for the bomb damage assessment teams uh, because the thermal damage, of course, depended a lot on the cloud cover, the reflection back. And these particular films have been very useful to those people in discerning the effect of the clouds on the survivors. No one had ever seen anything like this before. As I was mentioning, we didn't know about EMP, and I'm certain that we had an EMP signal on our recording film, and if we'd known that, we, we would have been able to very accurately measure the distance of our particular gauges, which were dropped on parachutes from the point of detonation. But all we looked for was the, the pulse showing the uh, blast pressure. Threw away all the other film. This is just a repeat for cameras in two planes. We were at 30,000 feet. Okay, thank you very much. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. If not, I'll read you a poem. <laughs> it's an interesting poem. I'll read the poem. It's by Ogden Nash. Now, some of you may not have heard of Ogden Nash. He, he writes presumably funny poems. This one is funny, but it's not so funny. And I used this poem once during the Kennedy regime when Harold Brown was DDR&E or maybe Secretary of the Air Force or something. He didn't like this poem. Let me, the name of the poem is Jack Do Good for Nothing. A cursory nursery tale for tote baiters. Once there was a kind-hearted lad named Jack Do Good for Nothing, the only son of a poor widow whom creditors did importune. So he set out in the world to make his fortune. His mother's blessing and a crust of bread was his only stake, and pretty soon he saw a frog that was about to be devoured by a snake. And he rescued the frog and drove the snake away. And the frog vowed gratitude to its dying day. And a little later on in his walk, why, he saw a little red hen about to be carried off by a hawk. And he rescued the little red hen and drove the hawk away. And the little red hen vowed that whenever he was in trouble, his kindness she would repay. And he walked a few more country blocks. And he saw a bunny rabbit about to be gobbled up by a fox. 
and he rescued the bunny rabbit before the fox could fall on it. And the bunny rabbit thanked Jack and told him any time he needed help just to call on it. And after all this rescuing, Jack was huffing and puffing. And a little further on, the snake and the hawk and the fox jumped him. And out of him, they beat the stuffing. They even stole his crust of bread and each ate a third of it. And the frog and the little red hen and the bunny rabbit said they were very har sorry when they heard of it. You see, Jack, against a cardinal rule of conduct, had been a transgressor. Never befriend the oppressed unless you are prepared to take on the oppressor. Thank you. That's a message. Okay, there's a question. Yeah. Why did we have to drop the second bomb? Did the Japanese not believe that we could really do it again? I don't know. I guess my feeling was after the first bomb, something again that innovativeness of Louis Alvarez, he uh, wrote a personal message on the bomb can on the uh, transmitter on our instruments to some of his Japanese physicist friends, explaining really what it was and telling the emperor this was to tell the emperor that this was an entirely new uh, type of device and he should immediately surrender. I have the feeling that it was touch and go. Uh, when you look at some of the pictures of the kamikaze pilots, uh, the history of the Japanese absolutely following the emperor who just couldn't lose face under normal circumstances. And I think any day that we saved in terminating the war was a day well spent. Uh, again, as I was mentioning, the number of lives lost in the second raid uh, was really smaller than lives which had been lost in previous raids. Now, you can argue, well, we could have waited, but I have the feeling that those individuals who would have gone out again and done raids while we were waiting, things didn't stop as far as the conventional action was concerned. Uh, in my opinion, this, the sooner we did it, the better. Anything one could have done, there are a lot of money morning quarterbacks, people making their careers on it today, uh, talking about what ifs. But at the time, remember, in this country, U.S. Japanese citizens, citizens of the U.S., were moved forcibly from the West Coast. They lost everything. They were citizens. <coughs> the attitude and the fear that we had during those times was quite hard to understand unless you were actually there at the time. Yes? The three of us, Wal uh, Larry Johnson, who's now a professor at the University of Idaho, Louis Alvarez, and myself. But our sole role was to measure the blast yield. On the other airplane, there was Parsons, and I guess that's it, plus the uh, only military were on that plane. There was a third plane, which uh, Bernie Waldman was in, in which he had a fast axe camera. He stayed out about 20 miles and he was to photograph the, the fireball. But it was sort of a handheld operation, only ran for a few seconds. He may have gotten something, but when the film went in for processing in the photo lab there, all they had been used to processing was black and white 16 millimeter gun camera. And the film came out with nothing on it. Emulsion, everything was gone. So whether there was something on it, we don't know. But those were the only people that took part. Yeah. Well, we didn't hear anything. Uh, first we knew that it had gone off was the, the whole inside of the plane lit up a white flash. We had been concerned of what the effect of the blast would be on the airplane. And for that, all we could do was wait. And we did get two very hard slaps on the airplane. And then it was all over. Uh, we didn't understand the two slaps till later on when we realized since it had been detonated about 2,000 feet that we had a reflected shock from the ground. Yes? How many At that time, we had no more out there. And uh, we may have had material for another one in about a week after the August 9th strike. Yes? Uh, 
Well, I've read uh, recently that indeed they did have a small project on the particular uh, endeavor. But I, I was not familiar with it. None of us were familiar at the time. Tom? Where, where were the pressure gauges supposed to be? Uh, uh, well, we dropped, the way it worked was the following. When they opened their bomb bay doors on the strike airplane, a tone came on. And we could hear that tone in our airplane. And that meant that we should open our bomb bay doors. And what we had were condenser microphone gauges and canisters about three feet long, about a foot in diameter, attached to uh, chest parachutes, and they were in our bomb racks. When the tone went off, that meant the drama bomb had been dropped, so we dropped our bomb, this, uh, dropped our canisters on these parachutes at the same time. It's interesting, in the press at that time, the Japanese press thought the bomb had been dropped by parachute. That's what the first reports were, actually our gauges. So we had been testing things that went over and down here in Albuquerque, and we expected in uh, the drop time for the bomb was about 42 seconds, and we knew approximately how many hundred feet the parachutes would drop. And we knew approximately, well, we had ballistics on the, uh, on the bomb, so we, we were pretty close, but I suspect we could have been a quarter or a half a mile off in actual distance. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>